Lodian Moore Stadium, Ontario, Colorado. The acronym is ANPAC. I am the Chief Judge of Consular Court. Uh, today is Class 42. Class 42. What did we learn in Class 41? Well, we started learning about what's called the French Protectorate of 1913, with the understanding that France came over the United States of America through all of their correspondence to let the United States of America know they're taking over the Moroccan Treaty. What does that mean? They're taking over the empire. They're enforcing the treaties. That's what Moors need to understand. How do you enforce the treaties? But what else was the French protected all about of 1913? It was a corollary of the Treaty of Fez of 1912. And the Treaty of Fez 1912 was a corollary of the Act of Algeciras 1906 and all the previous Moroccan treaties. So France is coming over, enforcing the treaties. And what is the United States doing? Panicking. So imagine that, Moors. If France can get the United States to panic because France had control of the treaty, think about it. France is not even a party to the contract because the contract says Moors and the citizens of the United States of America, not France. But France was a power attorney. So imagine if the power attorney has that much power. Imagine how much power Moors have as the original parties of that treaty. All right? So we keep talking about that today, okay? So as we always open up, as I said, we'll keep talking about what's the purpose of ANPAC study session is really about Moors coming back into the constitutional principles of enforcing treaties. And the treaties talk about statehood. The treaties talk about constitutions, and the well settled principles of what, what, what's called the triple principle, all right? So as you can see, ANPAC has this constitution up. Why is that important to understand? Because ANPAC, is following the instructions of the well settled principles of the Act of Algeciras, the, the triple principle, right? We have to keep maintaining that more, all right? So today, what we're going to do is we're going to more or less pick up where we left off, but not so much, okay? I'll explain. Okay, so this is the French Protected of 1913. We were reading this in class 41, right? So you got to go back to class 41 to get an understanding of what we first started initially reading. And we got down to a different section where we started talking about the Treaty of Madrid, Article 7 and 8, etc. All right? But prior to us getting to the part where we talked about uh, Article 7 and 8 of the Treaty of Madrid, just before that, I talked about Americans. I said that Moors were not Americans, right? And I said, why? I said, because there's no mention of Moors being, Amer being Americans in the treaties, all right? So I'd like to talk a little bit more about that today. So you rem remember in the document of the French Protector of 1913, right here in this particular section, right? We had got here February 13, 1914. You scroll down, because I want Moors to pick up right where I left off in terms of the comment that I made, right? Okay. So right here I was talking about American protégés in that country, right? And I said, Moors have to understand they are not Americans. The only time Moors are referred to as being Americans is when you're a protege of America. But I need to go deeper than that. I need to explain that to the Moors because the Moors have all been saying they are, they are Moorish Americans. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to take a pause on the French Protectorate. We're going to dive into what's called our Moors Americans. Are Moors Americans? But really the title is this. The contracting parties must be known. So we're talking about what? Treaties, right? Today we'll talk about the enforcement of treaties. In my hand, I have four treaties, okay? So hopefully the Moors at home can see this. I got the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, 1787, fully ratified. Who are the parties to this treaty? Moors and Americans. Citizens of the United States of America. So who are the parties? Moors and the citizens of the United States of America, which means Moors and Americans. Okay? What else we got? All right. Next, con next contract. Treaty of Peace and Friendship, 1836. Between who? Who are the parties? Moors and Americans citizens of the United States of America, okay? Who else do we have? Got the Treaty of 1880, Treaty of Madrid, 1880. 
who are the parties? If so, you are more subjects, Moors, and Americans, citizens of the United States of America, as well as other signatory powers, because it's a multilateral treaty, right? You got the signatory powers, which are the Christian powers, but more specifically, this is about who? Moors, and Moors are now protégés, subjects of Morocco. Okay, let's continue. Act of Algeciras, 1906, a Moroccan treaty. Who are the parties? Moors, if so, you are more subjects. And the signatory powers, which are the United States of America and the other signatory powers, the other colonial states, right? But who are the real parties? Morocco, Moors, United States of America, Americans, and the other signatory powers. So the parties must be known. We're talking about parties to a contract. What contract? The treaties. Okay? So today, we're talking about these four treaties. In these four treaties, it never refers to Moors as being Americans unless they're saying they're protégés of America, meaning you're the property of America because you no longer have a Moorish government. You're a stateless Moor that's a protégé of America. That must be understood. We're going to get into this today. All right? So right here, France is pointing out to the Moors and to the United States what? That the Moors are protégés of America. That must be understood. So let's jump into that today, okay? So up here on the board, what I have? The contracting parties must be known. Are Moors Americans? Answer, yes. In fact, yes. But no, in truth. You must understand the difference between fact and truth. Fact, Santa Claus is real. But in truth, he's fiction. That's the truth. Next question. Are Moors aboriginal to Morocco or America? Answer, Morocco. Because America is not the original name of the land. So how can you be... Uh, Aboriginal of America, well, that's not the original name of the land. We'll talk about that today. What else? Who are the parties to the contract? What contract? We just went over. Treaties, right? Treaties. Who are the parties? Moors and the Americans. That's the truth. We're going to break this down today because Moors need to understand what's happening. Why are we going over this? As more start to come back into statehood, Moors cannot bring old paradigms into your statehood. When Moors come back and now submit and consent to the entire submission of the laws of Morocco, the laws of the empire, when Moors come back to Morocco from the abstract and from the pen legislation, you cannot be referring to yourself as Americans. I'll prove that today. All right, let's get started. Okay. Here's all we're going to open up. Morris can look on Google, and Google Morris American identification cards, and all kinds of cards pop up. So this is just one example that I grabbed off of Google. This is public information. As you can see, I blocked out the good Morris name here. Right, and he actually blocked out his own face, etc. So I, I, I chose this card because he blocked out his own face. The good brother blocked out his own face, and I blocked out his name. Okay, but he had actually exposed his name on Google. All right, but I, I took the time to, to protect his privacy. Okay, so what's happening today? We're going to talk about how Moors have these nationality cards and don't realize they're admitting to the United States that they're sovereign citizens. With these nationality cards, they're admitting to the United States that they're still part of the jurisdiction of the United States. We're going to talk about that today. We'll break it down. Just have patience with me. Okay? All right. Let's get started. First things first. Let's get into some history, right? We always have to go backwards before we go forward. We got to go back and get the proper concept through context 
in order for us to bring it full circle. Let's get started. Okay, mother, if I can have you start reading. Where did Moors get the concept that Moors are Americans? Answer, Noah Webster's Dictionary, year 1828, as follows. American, adjective, pertaining to America. American noun, a native of America, originally applied to the aboriginals or copper-colored races found here by the Europeans, but now applied to the descendants of Europeans born in America. Okay, so most Moors quote this definition all the time. My first question to the Moors is this. When it comes to the treaties, did the, did the Moors say they were Americans because they saw that in a treaty? Or did they say they're Americans because they got this from a definition from Noah Webster? And the answer is, most Moors are using this as a basis of why they're the uh, Americans. That's the truth. Let's break this down, shall we? Where did the Moors get the concept that Moors are Americans? Answer, Noah Webster's Dictionary here, 1828, as follows. American, adjective, pertaining to America. America, now, a native of America. This is where Moors get caught up, right here. A native of America. They see that right there, a native of America. So Moors have been told they're a native, and you are. But you're not the native of America. Remember, Noah Webster wrote this, and we're going to find out why he wrote it like this. Originally applied to the aboriginals. You see this word right here? Applied. Moors got to learn how to read. This word is applied to you the same way the word black was applied to you. Just because they applied the word black to you don't make you who you are. Just because they applied the word American to you don't make you who you are. You're going to find out here in a minute why they applied the word American to you. Let's continue. To the aboriginals. So right here it said they originally applied to the aboriginals. They're telling you some truths here. They applied the word America to the aboriginals. They applied it. That does not make you who you are. Let's continue. Or the copper colored races, so you know they're talking about the Moors. Found here by the Europeans, but now applied to the descendants of Europeans born in America. So the first thing we got to do is got to get an understanding. America is applied to the aboriginals. And America is what? Applied to the descendants of Europeans. Why is that? Let's find out why. Right here is a quote from George Washington. When you look up the definition of American, it has this, this quote, right? It says, the name American must always exalt the pride of patriotism. George Washington. Where did they get that from? See, George Washington's papers of 1796, this is last year in office, He's transferring. This was one of the quotes, small quotes they told from some of his papers. Why was George Washington talking like that? George Washington understood that Sidi Muhammad accepted the Treaty of Peace and Friendship when they revised the name on the treaty to say United States of America in 1789. Keeping in mind, prior to 1789, the Treaty of Peace and Friendship that was signed in 1786, 1787, was under who? Articles of Confederation. George Washington now puts together a new government. They dissolved the Articles of Confederation. They sent over to Sidi Mohammed in 1789. Hey, man, we got a new constitution. Here's the new name of the parties. Can you now revise the treaty and apply the word United States of America as the party? Sidi Mohammed accepted. Okay. So therefore, what is George Washington saying here? He said that we're Americans now. The colonists get call themselves Americans. Why? Because Sidi Muhammad accepted those terms and conditions. Let's keep learning. Why did George Washington call himself American? Answer. Mother, could you read that for me? In the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, 1787, and revised in 1789, the Sultan of Morocco consented, ratified, and promulgated the colonists as being the Americans. Sidi Mohammed allowed the colonists to call themselves the Americans. Okay, 
Treaty Supreme Law Land. Treaty Supreme Law Land. Got four treaties here. All of them say they talk about the Americans as a party and Moors as a party. So if Treaty Supreme Law Land, then how can Moors say they're the Americans? We're going to talk about that. Let's go through a quick, brief history lesson. This is very important, especially for young boys. Young boys need to understand why they are not Americans and why they are Americans. Did you catch what I just said? In fact, you're American, but in truth, you're not. Let's learn in fact versus truth. Let's learn about the history. Okay, well. Brief, brief history lesson. The Moors signed the Treaty of Granada, Spain, on November 25, 1491. The Moors honored the treaty and relinquished Granada on January 1, 1492. On August 3, 1492, Christopher Columbus set sail and finally landed in the Western Empire of Morocco in October 1492. The abstract of the word America was created after Columbus travels in 1492. The Moors were already in the Western Empire of Morocco prior to Christopher Colon Columbus travels in 1492. Okay, so you must understand, the colonists were not even in the continent of Northwest of Mexico until after 1492. That must be already understood. Most Moors already know that. That's, that's, that's basic information, right? Let's continue. Furthermore, the word America was coined, trademarked, by Martin Valsi Mueller after America's Vespucius travels throughout Morocco's Western Empire in 1499. America's Vespucius Latinized version of the name is spelled Amerigo Vespucci. America's Vespucius published letters in Europe were the basis of Val C. Mueller's year 1507 drawn map. Stop. This is very important for Moore to understand. Let's pause right here. The word America was coined. Coined by who? Coined means trademark. It was trademarked by Martin Walsenmuller. Who's Martin Walsenmuller? He was a German. In Germany at the time. But why did he coin the word America? Because America's Vespucius travels throughout Morocco's Western Empire in 1499. So as, as he was writing letters, America Vespucci was writing letters, eventually over the years, the Europeans started to pick up these letters. And eventually what happened is the map maker, the map maker, Okay, Walsen Mueller, in the year 1507, drew the map and called the continent America. Why did they call it America? Let's continue to learn. Okay. America, Americus Vespucius published letters in Europe were the basis of Wal Walsen Mueller's year 1507 drawn map, which is the first usage of the word America. Furthermore, in the 1500s, European usage of American denoted the native inhabitants of the New World. The earliest recorded use of this term in English is in Thomas Hackett's 1568 translation of Andre Thevet's book, France, Antarctic. Thevet himself had referred to the natives as Amerique. In the following century, the term was extended to European settlers and their descendants in the Americas. The earliest recorded use of English American dates to 1648 in Thomas Gage's The English American, his travail by sea and land, or a new survey of the West Indies. Okay, so young boys, when did America get its name? In 1507, why? Because America Vespucci was traveling in the land of Morocco, the western side of the empire. Okay? 
So the first use of the word America. Furthermore, in the 1500s, European usage of America denoted the native inhabitants of the New World. So what happened? Once they named the land America, now they refer to the inhabitants as Americans because that became the general word they were using, just like they call all melanated people black all around the world. They go to Africa, they call them black. You go to China, you got, got dark-skinned Chinese, they call them black Chinese. Everywhere you go, they call people black. It's a generic term to describe a group of people. So what did the Europeans do and the English do? They pick up that word America, and they just apply that to everyone that was in the continent of a Mexican. It became a generic term. All right? Let's read it again. Furthermore, in the 1500s, European use of America denoted the native inhabitants of the New World. In other words, they branded you as American, but that's not what makes you who you are. The earliest recorded use of this term in English in Thomas Hackett's 1568 translation of Andre Thevet's book, France and Arctica. So they didn't start really using the word to 1568 when they really started to have a lot of books to talk about this new world called America. Okay? In the following century, the term was extended to Europeans. What following century? So we, we went from the 1500s, right? Now we're in the 1600s. In the following century, 1600s, the term was extended to European settlers and their descendants in the Americas. Because now it's called Americas because the German map maker said it was called Americas. They just called it Americas, a generic word. Right? But now it's being what? It's being applied, applied to descendants of who? Europeans. It's an applied word. For who were the Europeans? Europeans had all kinds of nationalities. So it became a generic word for the Europeans. You're going to learn in a little while why that is, but I'll give you a brief. You got to understand, George Washington did not want to be referred to as English. He wanted to be an expatriate of Great Britain. He didn't want to be an Englishman. He did not want to be referred to as European. He wanted his own independence for his 13 colonies, and the word American was the word. That made a distinction between European and English. He said, American, that's what we are. Why? Because he didn't want to be taxed by anyone. All right, let's continue. The earliest recorded use of English American dates to 1648, and Thomas Gage, the English American, his trivial by the sea and land, or a new survey of the West Indies. Now look at this. Your Dutch masters, your Portuguese, your Spaniards were referring to this land at one time as the West Indies, because they had already colonized parts of Akibalon, i.e. Africa. So now they're referring to this land over here, the Western Empire of Morocco, as India. They've had all kinds of names for this land. You even learn that the Dutch even came over and named the north side of northwest of Mexico as New Amsterdam. Then later on, it was converted to what's called New York. You're going to learn about that. Let's continue. We're going through a history lesson real quick. Okay? Now let's go through some timelines. Because what I just showed you is that a German came up with the word American, and he named it after an ex explorer. See, immediately Moore's got to start asking himself, let's just pause. Why you call yourself American when that's a made-up name from a map maker that was German who named out the Italian explorer? Why would you do that? Let's continue. Timeline of Morocco being renamed as America. Timeless. Western Empire of Morocco has been in existence since ancient times to present day. Okay, let's pause right there. Why do I say time? Morocco is timeless. You can't count back the number of years how long we've been here. You can't. It's just simply timeless. So when you put a timeline on it, you can't. It's just timeless. Continue, Mother. January 1, 1492. Moors relinquished Granada to the Spaniards and Rome. Mm -hmm. So you know the Roman Holy Empire was helping Spain. Fourteen ninety two, Cristobal Colon, aka Christopher Columbus, set sail to see the empire of Western Morocco. 
Note, the word colony or colonizer or colonialism stems from Cristobal Colon's successful genocide of Moorish people and lands. The British were not the first colonizers. That's important to understand, Morris. When they talk about colonialism, right, people being colonized, that comes from Christopher Colon. Cologne colony. That's where the word comes from. The Spanish were the first to come over to Western Empire of Morocco to start colonizing. They were the first. Who was the second? France came after that. Who came after that? Dutch, etc. The British were the last to come over to Western Empire of Morocco to colonize. They were the last. That must be understood. They were not, the British are not the first colonizers. Let's continue. 1493, the Spaniard Christopher... No, 1492, right. Uh, 1492, Western Empire of Morocco is referred to as the New World and the Land of the Moors by Christopher Colon Columbus. 1493, the Spaniard Christopher Colon's Columbus <clears throat> and other Spanish vandals renamed the islands and the central and south areas of western Morocco after Spanish names, example, Hispaniola, etc., and the Spanish language quickly overran the southern half of western Morocco by use of force. Note, the Spaniards did not establish a Spanish colony in the northwest empire of Morocco until 1526. Okay, that's important to understand. So, Christopher Columbus came over, other Spaniards came over. They started colonizing, colonizing the islands in South Morocco and Central Morocco, okay? Before they ever started getting to North Morocco, okay? That must be understood. They didn't start colonizing Northwest of Mexico until 1526. They had started coming over here in 1492. So it took them over 100 years before they even settled one colony in Northwest of Mexico. That must be understood, Morris. Okay, well. 1499, Western Empire of Morocco is referred to as the New World and the Land of the Moors by Americus Ameri Amerigo Vespucci. 1507, map, map, map maker Martin Valsi Mueller coined trademarked the word America to recognize Vespucci's explorations in Morocco. Let's pause right there. I'm going to say it again. Young boys. You must understand the word America is a coin trademark word. That's the reason why when the colonists finally came over here and started selling up, selling their colonies, their first colony was what? Jamestown, right? Jamestown. But even from the 1600s all the way up to nearly 1800, remember now, they didn't call themselves Americans on, in writing of a treaty or constitution until 1789. It took them nearly 300 years to use the word American. Why? It was trademark. They couldn't use it. They eventually started using it in 1789 and got trademarked in 1507. So young Lord, why would you call yourself American when you know it's a trademark word of an Italian who's named after Italian, just like Africa is named after Cipriano Africanus, a German, excuse me, a Russian, <laughs> a Roman general. Africa is named after a Roman general, Scipio Africanus, from the Punic Wars of 200 BC. Let's continue. 1507 to 1532, Europeans adopted the new official name and maps of the New World as being America until present day, 21st century. 1789, the Sultan in the Empire of Morocco signs the revised Treaty of Peace and Friendship with George Washington, Unite, with George Washington's United States of America after they dissolved the, the Articles of the Confederation as a party to the Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1787. Okay, so this is what I was saying earlier. The original parties, the original parties, the contracting parties, 
1787 was the Article, Article of Confederation, which were the colonists who were expatriates of Great Britain and expatriates of other European states. Now they're going under, under the name of America. Why? 1789, Washington, Washington now changes the Constitution and their government to the United States of America, and C.D. Muhammad allows them now retroactively to go back and change the name to the Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1787, even though George Washington then, then petitioned a new name to 1789. That must be understood. That's when they became Americans lawfully, because C. Muhammad allowed them to be the Americans because the word American applies to just a trademark word. Let's continue. Seventeen eighty-seven. The American is any person that possesses an allegiance or acquiescence to the jurisdiction of the United States of America Republic, or the United States of America, or the United States, in pursuance to the ratified and promulgated treaties of peace and friendship, seventeen eighty-seven and say eighteen thirty-six. Enter Alia. Okay. It's important to understand. 1787, the American is any person that possesses allegiance or acquiescence to the jurisdiction of the United States of America Republic, because that's what the Treaty of Peace and Friendship is all about, or the United States of America Corporation, or the United States Corporation, and pursuant to the ratified and pro um, prom promulgated treaties of peace and friendship, 1787 and 1836, into audience. Why is that important to understand? The only people that are lawfully the Americans is those people that are descendants of Americans that C. Muhammad allowed the colonists to consider themselves Americans, or those people who have been naturalized illegally or those people who come over to the Americas and pledge their allegiance to America and have a dual citizenship, or either they renounce their old citizenship and become citizens of the United States. That must be understood, Morris. The only Americans are the people that are expatriates of England and expatriates of Europe, or those people who have acquiesced or capitulated to being Americans because you have failed to come back to your own Moroccan state government. Let's continue. The word America or American only applies to the descendants of expatriates of England and Europe per Moroccan treaty law and to any persons that become naturalized citizens of the U.S. Stateless Moors are, in fact, Moorish Americans because they are sovereign citizens that have failed to comply with the supreme law of the land. Example, the Treaty of Madrid, Article 15, as follows. Any subject of Morocco who has been naturalized in a foreign country and who shall return to Morocco shall, after having remained for a length of time, equal to that which shall have been regularly necessary for him to obtain such naturalization, choose between the entire submission of the empire. Okay, let's stop right there. This is saying a lot more. This is the words from a treaty. Treaty is the supreme law of the land. The Sultan gave specific instructions to Moors. To Moors, okay? Now, Stateless Moors are, in fact, Moorish Americans, in fact, but is it true? Because they are sovereign citizens that have failed to comply with the supreme law of the land. And what is the supreme law of the land? For example, the Treaty of Madrid, Article 15, as follows. What do the instructions of the treaty say? Let's listen. It's very specific. Moors got to pay attention. Listen. Any subject of Morocco. Well, who's the subjects? Protégés of America. 
but the Sultan is already telling you that you're a Moor in Morocco, never referred to you as American, referred to you as a Moroccan of Morocco, a Moor. Listen, any subject of Morocco, that's how it starts off, who has been naturalized in a foreign country, so we know what the foreign country is, United States, and who shall return to Morocco. Wait. So any subject of Morocco shall return to Morocco. It's already talking about Morocco two times already. Never talked about America. Shall after having remained for a length of time equal to that which shall have been regularly necessary for him to obtain such naturalization, choose between, choose between, choose between the entire submission of the empire, etc. What's happening? Listen to me more. Listen to me very carefully, especially young ones. Listen. You have an obligation to choose between. That means two things, right? Between, between what? Entire submission of the empire. Listen. Look at this ID. The Moors have IDs. They got several different IDs. This is just an example. This particular Moor is saying he's an Aboriginal American national. Well, we already learned that America is trademark. It's named after America Vespucci, a German. <clears throat> America Vespucci was Italian. And the Sea Muhammad allowed them, the colonists, who are refugees in Morocco to be the Americans, because Sidi Muhammad knew the word American had nothing to do with Moors. But Moors said what? I'm Aboriginal American. America is not an Aboriginal. It's just a term. It's not a nationality. But what's important here? When Moors say what? Right here it says nationality, more American. Listen. Hopefully more can see that at home. Right here, nationality, more American. What's happening? See, that's that choose between. Watch. Listen. There's Morocco. There's America. Two different jurisdictions. Okay. When you tell us that you're Moorish American. You're a Moorish American. Go back to the ID card. Moorish American. Listen, what does the treaty say? Here's the original treaty. Any subject of Morocco who has been naturalized in a foreign country who shall return to Morocco shall after having remained for a length of time equal to that which shall have been regularly necessary for him to obtain such naturalization. Choose between. Choose between. Hold up. How are you choosing between when you're claiming both? That's just like LeBron James saying, they ask him, okay, LeBron, what team do you play for? He says, uh, Cavaliers, Lakers. <laughs> no, no, LeBron is serious. What, what team do you play for? Cavaliers, Lakers. Wait, that don't make no sense. He, you play for the Cavaliers or the Lakers. LeBron, so who do you play for? Cavaliers, Lakers. Okay, so let me ask you again, LeBron. When the Cavaliers play the Lakers, which team you gonna be on? Both. That's what you're saying to the colonists when you write these identification cards and say you're a Moorish American. Either you are more of Morocco or you are American of the United States. You gotta pick one. Why? Because the Sultan said that. The Sultan said that. Let's go back to it. Where is that? Right here. Morris had to do what? Choose between. Choose between. That's in the rights of indigenous people. 
Article 5, it tells you again, you got to choose. Okay, right here, the treaty, which is more supreme than the articles of the um, indigenous people, the treaty is more supreme than the rights of indigenous people declaration. So let's look at the treaty. Treaty supreme all the land. Most have to do what? Choose between what? The entire submission. What does entire mean? One percent. Submission to what? The empire. What empire? Well, they tell you two times. Morocco, Morocco. Where does it say American in there? It's trying to tell you get out of America. Foreign country. America. Get out of it. But what are Moors doing? Listen. Say they're Moorish Americans. Moorish Americans. Okay, wait a minute. So you're saying you're a Moorish American. You're a Cavalier Laker. Don't make no sense. Now I get it. When Moors started first learning about their status, Morris actually thought because some colonists told him they came off a boat from Africa. So I get it. Morris eventually had to start learning they were already home. I get that concept. But here's the problem. When a Moor puts on a fez and a turban and you tell people you are Moor, you're telling the whole world you're competent and you understand yourself. You know who you are and you know, you, you know exactly where you're from. Then you turn around and say, yeah, I'm a Cavalier Laker. I'm a Moorish American. What does that mean? When you say you're a Moorish American, this is like saying you're a Chinese American. You know what a Chinese American is? That's a dual citizenship. You know what a Mexican American is? That's a dual citizenship. When you say you're a Moorish American, that's a dual citizenship. But the problem is, you're not a citizen or a national of a Moorish state. So the reality is, you're just a sovereign citizen of the United States. What does sovereign citizen mean? Why are, why are the police rolling up on us? Why are people telling more they're sovereign citizens? Why is that? Because more don't understand what sovereign citizen means. The colonists are telling you the truth. They're telling you're sovereign. Yeah, you're sovereign. But you're sovereign to the United States of America because you don't have your own sovereign state. Yeah, you're sovereign because you're a Moor by birthright. You have a birthright to your land. But since you have failed to comply to the treaty, now you are what you call a stateless person. And what happens to stateless people? Let's learn about that. Mother, can you read this for me, please? Stateless person, international law. A natural person who is not considered a national by any country. The Stateless Persons Convention, 1954, provides these people with certain protections as well as obliging them to abide by the laws of the country where they reside. It is, of course, quite possible that a person may be without any nationality, in which case he is referred to as a stateless person. Okay, thank you very much. So what's happening? Who are stateless people? Okay, they tell you in the Black Law Dictionary, Moore was always reading the Black Law Dictionary. Let's listen. Black stateless person. International law, Moore's got to do what? Study international law. Let's continue. Let's continue. International law. A natural person who is not considered a national by any country. The Stateless Person Convention 1954 provides these people with certain protections as well as obliging them to abide by the laws of the country where they reside. More to say, well, I don't... I don't I don't reside in the United States. Okay, then where do you domicile? Tell me the name of your state provincial government that has a constitution, flag, seal, open allegiance to said state, that you have ratified that constitution, you have now taken that constitution, you probably with the United Nations Charter. Do you have that state? If the answer is no, then guess what? You're stateless. And if you're stateless, you must abide by what? You must abide by the laws of the country where they reside. Laws reside in the United States of America. Why? Because you're there temporarily. That's what residency means. You're a temporary state. And you, until you do what? Listen. Until you do what? Choose between the entire submission of the empire. When you do that, then you come back and domicile in Morocco, in Morocco, in Morocco, not America. 
Let's continue. Okay. If I can have the Minister of Foreign Affairs read this for me, please. Stateless Moors are in fact American only because they have not chosen the entire submission to the laws of the empire. Entire submission means the capitulatory Moorish Americans finally recognize that they are not American. Then afterward, they must reject the applied branding of being the Aboriginal Americans and then restore 100% of their Moorish state governments in Morocco. Thank you, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Listen. Stated Moors are in fact Americans only because they have not chosen the entire submission to the laws of the empire. How do I know they haven't chosen the entire submission? Okay, let's go back to the reference point. This is what Moors continuously keep giving the colonists. Moors keep saying what? We're Moorish Americans. What else do Moors keep doing? This is what Moors are doing. Moors are saying, I'm Aboriginal American. Where does it say that in the treaty? You have an obligation to come back and do what? Choose between the entire submission of the laws of the empire. What empire? Morocco, not America. Why am I explaining this? Because as more start understanding, when you start coming back into statehood, you can't bring those old paradigm ways of doing things. I get it. First, we had to understand we was of the continent of America. Okay, once you put on a feds, you got a nationality card, you tell everybody you know who you are, that much you, you have an obligation to get back to these treaties. This is why I tell the Moors, put this constitution down and pick up your treaties. When you pick up the treaties, the treaties tell you, you must come back to what? A Moroccan government. Let's continue. Right here. Entire submission means, entire submission means the capitulatory Moorish Americans finally recognize that, that they are not Americans. Then afterwards, they must reject the applied branding of being the average Americans. Where does the word applied come from? Noah Webster's Dictionary. It was applied to us, but that does not make us who we are. And Moors are holding on to the fact of one definition from Noah Webster. And where did Noah Webster get that, that, that um, definition from? 1828, right? Okay, why did he define it like that? You know why? Because Sidi Muhammad and George Washington defined it in 1789. Now here comes, George, here comes uh, Noah Webster in 1828. Who's the American? The colonists. Why? Because the treaty is supreme law of the land. Let's read it again. Entire submission means the capitulatory Moorish Americans finally recognize that they are not Americans. Then afterwards, they must reject the applied branding of being the Aboriginal Americans because there's no such thing as an Aboriginal American. It's a coined term by Germans and Italians and then restore 100% of their Moorish state governments in Morocco. Why do I say that? Because I'm quoting the treaty. Treaty of Madrid, got to come back 100%. That's what entire means, 100%. Let's continue. Okay, Mark. Entire means 100% restoration of independent states and the restoration of the central body politic for the Western Empire of Morocco, for example, but not limited to a Moorish constitution that outlines the permanent latitude and longitude of the state, three branches of government, state flag, empire flag, state seal, allegiance to state public inauguration, ratification and depository of your Moorish state constitution, and all ratified treaties, conventions, declarations, and the Charter of the United Nations with the Secretariat of the Charter and garner more state ID cards for the nationals. What's that called? Coming back into full powers. So what's that called? Following the instructions of the Treaty of Madrid, Article 15. Come checking the boxes, coming back into the entire submission 
of the empire means you're no longer calling yourself an American. You're not American. However, you are American if you're a protege. Let's continue. Okay, Mo. Moorish, Moorish nationals have never been Americans, and Moorish nationals will never be Americans without the consent of a Moroccan government. Okay, where do we get that from? The treaty. That's, that's not Ampax hyperbole. Okay, let's take a look at it. Just a moment. Okay, Article 15, Treaty of Madrid, Article 15, right? Any subject of Morocco who has been naturalized in a foreign country and who shall return to Morocco shall have to have remained for a length of time, equal to which shall have been regularly necessary for him to obtain such naturalization. Choose between entire submission to the laws of the empire and the obligations to quit Morocco unless it shall be proved that his naturalization in a foreign country was obtained with the consent of the government of Morocco. Now listen, how many times the word Morocco listed in Article 15? Let's count it. One, two, three, four, five. Five times, one article. Did it ever mention America? Did it ever say that Moors are Americans that's trying to get back to America? No, because Sidi Muhammad, all the colonists know where they got the word America from. It's a social construct that has become organic because Sidi Muhammad allowed it to become organic. And Moors can't be aboriginal of America because it's a made up social construct. And we can't claim two jurisdictions. But the worst part is, when you say you're a Moor, who defines you as saying you're a Moor? Listen. Here's that identification card. Okay? This is the one we're looking at. Just a moment. Okay. Be patient with me, Morris. I'm going to get us through this. Okay, here you go. Tell me the name of the state provincial government, the independent state that issued you this nationality card from your state. According to Article 15, you must submit to the entire laws of the empire. Where are you getting this nationality card? Because that's all this is, is a nationality card. This has nothing to do with government credentials. It's just a nationality card. Anybody's entitled to have a nationality card. But when more start quoting on here stuff about government and the speech, that's when you start becoming patently frivolous and arbitrary and capricious. Who issued you this card? Morris, we got to start telling the truth, Morris. Morris, we got to be honest with ourselves. Morris got pain. Morris want to fix this. How do we fix it? We just simply need to follow the instructions. And this is not the instructions. This is what you call taking shortcuts. And I get it. We're trying to put brakes on this thing. But this is not how you stop it. This is how you just try to slow things down. But this is contrary to Moroccan law. What do I mean? The Sultan said, come back to the entire submission, not to take shortcuts. Let's continue. Moorish nationals have never been Americans, and Moorish nationals will never be Americans without the consent of a Moroccan government. Continue. The common law truth, Moors are Moroccans, and Moroccans are in the empire of Morocco, and Morocco is in a Mexum, and a Mexum is the sacred trust of the Moors. And the Moors are the trustees of the treaties of planet Earth. And in anything contrary is notwithstanding. All right. So now we're talking truth. Mm -hmm. That's fact versus truth. What's the truth? What's the common law truth? What's nature's law? Matriarchal law? Common law? Jurisprudence? What is it? Here's the truth. The common law truth. Moors are Moroccans. And Moroccans are in the empire of Morocco. 
And Morocco is in a Mexum. And a Mexum is the sacred trust of the Moors. And the Moors are the trustees of the treaties of planet Earth. And anything contrary is not withstanding. Because treaties is the supreme law of the land. And Moors are not the Americans. The Americans are the other party. The Moors are the first party. We're the authors of the treaties. And the Americans that Sidi Muhammad allowed them to call themselves American because he knew it was a social construct, he didn't care nothing about the word American because Sidi Muhammad knew they couldn't call themselves Moors. Sidi Muhammad knew they couldn't say they was in Morocco because Sidi Muhammad wanted to make a distinction between those jurisdictions. Moors are not American unless you're a protege of America, which makes you the property of America. Let's continue. However, the ICJ judgment of 1952, France versus United States of America, says that Moorish Americans, example, subjects and protégés, are legally Americans by acquiescence and capitulation. Okay, thank you. Let's talk truth. What did the world court say about Moor status? What status do the Moors have? They are protégés and subjects because Moors have capitulated, acquiesced, or tacit acquiesced to being citizens of the United States because Moors have failed to do what? Come back to the entire submission of the laws of the empire. So therefore, the ICJ said about the Moors, well, the Moors failed to follow the supreme law of the land. Let's read it. However, the ICJ judgment of 1952, France versus United States of America, says that Moorish Americans, i.e., subjects and protégés, are legally, legally Americans by acquiescence and capitulation. Why? Because the ICJ knows you're not American. France knows you're not American. Everybody knows you're not Americans, but you are American by fact, if in fact you have failed to comply to the treaties. That's why I tell Morris, put this down. You keep saying enforce the Constitution. Okay, enforce the Constitution on yourself. What does it say? It says put this down and go back to the treaties. Question. So are Moors Americans? Yes, in fact. And no, in truth, nevertheless, the Moors cannot serve two masters. You cannot say you play for the Cavaliers Lakers. You cannot say you're Moorish American because, oh, two separate jurisdictions. And the treaty is specific. Why do you think the king of Morocco in 1958 through a conspiracy with the United States, through the Moors underneath the bus and tried to omit Article 15 of the Treaty of Madrid. And said that the Article 15 now is what? Obsolete. Nationality, obsolete. What was happening? So the United States knew that all Moors had to do is force the treaty. But wait, that happened in 1958. Isn't what the king of Morocco and the United States did contrary to the Charter of the United Nations? Because the Charter of the United Nations that came out in 1945 was all about what in the preamble? Enforcing treaties. What else happened in 1948? The Declaration of Human Rights said what? You are entitled to a nationality, Article 15, right? Human rights. So Moors have every human right according to the Charter, according to the Declaration of Human Rights, and according to the treaty. So everything that the king of the kingdom of Morocco and the United States administrator, everything they did was contrary to Moroccan treaties and contrary to international law. That must be understood. So Moors cannot serve two masters. Let's continue. Okay, well. For the record, no other nationals of South, Central, or North Amexum refer to themselves as being Americans other than stateless Moors and the citizens of the United States. For example, Mexicans do not refer to themselves as being Americans.
Panamanians do not refer to themselves as being Americans. Colombians do not refer to themselves as being Americans. Brazilians do not refer to themselves as being Americans. Canadians do not refer to themselves as being Americans. Well, hold up. Listen. We're talking about the continent. The expansive continent of a maximum, north, central, and south. Why is it only in what they call the latitude, longitude of what commonly known as the United States, only the people in that subsection of what they call North America? Let's look at it. These are the only people who call themselves Americans, Americans in the entire continent from the tip of Greenland all the way down to Chile and the surrounding islands. Who are the only people arguing over the word American? I'll tell you who. Moors and Americans. People in Canada call themselves Americans. Soon as you go south of the Rio Grande into Mexico and on down to Chile, everybody calls themselves by their free national name. So why is Moors the only one arguing about their Americans? You know why? Because they found that in a definition from Noah Webster's dictionary. But they went to the treaties. The treaties never refer to you as being American. They all refer to you as being a Moor or a Moorish government or a subject or a protege. It never refers to you being American unless they're classifying you as being the property of America. We are not Moorish Americans, but you are Moorish American if you're stateless. Mother? Why? Because the United States of America is a political extraterritorial jurisdiction of 50 interdependent union states including the U.S. island territories in Morocco. The nationals from the other recognized 34 states of the continent do not refer to themselves as being Americans because they are not Americans. They are aboriginal Moors and hybrid Moors that have consented to the politi political jurisdiction and name of their permanent state provincial government within the Moroccan empire. Did you catch what just, I just said? These are my notes, by the way. These are my notes of AMPAC. You must understand, I have an obligation as a council court judge, as a chief cause of AMPAC, to do what? Enforce treaties, to enforce constitutions. My job as the judge is to do what? Interpret the law and enforce the law. And I'm trying to let the Moors know as consular court, because Moors talking about they want consular court. Okay, Moors, how are you going to enforce consular court if you call yourself American? The only Moors can enforce consular court is Moors of a state, and your state must come back to a Moroccan government, not an American government. Listen. Why do people in all the other states in the continent never refer to themselves as being American? Why? I'll tell you why. Because the United States of America is a political extraterritorial jurisdiction of 50 interdependent union states. What does interdependent mean? The United States of America has a bundle package of 50 states within it. But on the international level, they consider themselves one state called the United States of America. They're one state on the international level. But domestically, they are 50 states plus the surrounding territories they're claiming as property. Take, for instance, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is not a state, according to international law. Puerto Rico is not recognized as a state even by the 50 other states. It's just a political territory of the United States. The nationals from the other recognized 34 states of the continent do not refer to themselves as being Americans because they are not Americans. Who's the Americans? The Americans are the colonists of the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. The Americans are anyone who's descendants of said treaty that are the colonists, expatriates of England and Europe, 
The Americans is anyone who now has been naturalized in a foreign country. The Americans are any other foreigners who come over intentionally to sign on and get a dual nationality, dual citizenship. Those are the Americans, according to law. But what did the treaty say? The treaty says you're a Moor in Morocco and you must come back and submit, choose between the entire submission of the laws of the empire. Let's continue. They are Aboriginal Moors and hybrid Moors that have consented, consented, consented to the political jurisdiction and name of their permanent state, provincial government within the Moroccan Empire. So where are the Moor states? Moors need to understand when Moors come back and submit to their Moor state, then you're coming back to Morocco. It just can't be your mere expression out of your mouth. It can't be just because you put together a nationality card, because that's all this is. This is not a state provincial identification from your state, which makes you now a national of your state. And when you give this to the colonists, whether you give it to the police or you send it as a copy to the administrators of the colonial states, as soon as they read it and see the top and say, you said you're an Aboriginal of America? You just admitted that you are in the jurisdiction of America. You have every right to your nationality calling yourself a Moor, but you must study international law and understand as soon as you throw in the word America into it, you just claim the jurisdiction. Because the treaties are specific. You either come back to the entire submission of Morocco, or either you're a citizen of the United States. Moors got to choose. Right here. What was the ICJ talking about? The ICJ said, the ICJ judgment of 1952, France versus United States of America, says that Moorish Americans, i.e. subjects and protégés, are legally Americans by acquiescence and capitulation. What's this word, capitulation? The ICJ talks about this a lot. Other colonial states talk about this capitulation a lot. When Moors start studying international law, you'll start seeing this word capitulation a lot. Okay, let's, let's really look at this. Hold up. What's happening with this word? Capitulation. What does this mean? We're going to look it up here in a minute. It's a compound word. Do you see it? Capitulations. You see capital? See right there? Capital? Colonists always say they have a capitalist society. What does that mean? Capital because they captured, 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 capitulation, captured the enemy. And now they're running a capital society. Capitulations. Okay, let's look at them. Capitulations. Mother. Cap capitulation. In military law, the surrender of a fort, fortified town, or army in the field to a besieging or opposing army. The treaty or agreement between the commanding officers, which embodies the terms and conditions on which the surrender is made. Okay, let's stop right there. What does capitulation mean? It means in military law, so the United States came over with use of force, the Spanish came over with use of force, the French came over with use of force, the Dutch came over with use of force, and colonized Moors, right? It is the surrender, the surrender of a fort, fortified town, or army in the field of besieging or opposing army. So they said the Moors surrendered. Surrendered what? Our governments, our territories, our rights. We surrendered our common authority and became the property of Americans. What happened? The treaty or the agreement between the commanding officers which embodies the terms and conditions of which surrender is made. So what's happening? What are they saying here? That the Moors surrendered what? What did the Moors surrender? The Moors surrendered their treaty. How did we surrender the treaty? Because we stopped having functional governments. We capitulated by being surrendered and not operating our own Moorish governments in Morocco. The Moors failed to come back into statehood. 
which means now the treaties, basically, we have waived our right to the treaty because we're not claiming to be the party of the treaty. And the only way to be a party, you must come back to what? You got to choose the entire submission. It didn't say somewhat submission. It didn't say half submission. It said entire. That's 100%. And until we do that, we have waived our rights to this treaty under surrender status. We surrendered our own rights. Because we're taking shortcuts. And we're referring to ourselves as the Americans. That's an oxymoron. You can't be the more and the American. You said you're both sides of the contract. Which part of the contract are you? This treaty of peace and friendship, 1787. Two parties. It's a bilateral treaty. Two parties, Moors and Americans. Which one are you, Moors? Let's continue. In international law, capitulations is the name used for treaty engagements between the Turkish government and the principal states of Europe by which subjects of the latter, residents in the territory of the former, will, were exempt from the laws. Okay. Just a moment. Of the places where they dwelt. Okay. Invasion of Crimea, 116. The usages of the Franks begin in what are known in international law as the capitulations, granting rights to extraterritoriality to Christians residing or traveling in Mohammedan countries. By these capitulations, a usage was established where that Franks, a generic name for all participants in such privileges, being in Turkey, whether domiciled or temporarily, should be under the jurisdiction, civil and criminal, of their respective ministers and consuls. Okay, thank you, Mother. Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's learn. This is AMPAC study session. This is about studying more. What are we studying? We're studying international law so Moors can get the answers to the test. Okay, let's go. Right here. International law. Right here. So watch this, Moors. In international law, so we keep seeing this word international law. We looked up stateless persons, it says international law. We're looking up capitulations, international law. Moore's got to study international law. Let's listen. In international law, capitulations is the name used for the treaty engagements between the Turkish government. Who's the Turkish government? That's Moore's government. See, you have to understand when the colonists write the Black Law Dictionary, they use these two words called blacks and Turkish. Blacks on the front of the cover, Black's Law Dictionary, talking about Moors, they use this word Turkish. They're talking about the Moroccan Empire. But they don't use the word Moor because they, they're told not to use the word Moor, even though they define the word Moor in the Black's Law Dictionary. Listen. Capitulations is the name used for the treaty engagements between between, remember, Treaty of Madrid, Article 15, talked about what? Choosing between. Now here, right here, you got the word between. Between who? The Turkish government and the principal states of Europe. That's that between. Okay, Morris. You say you're a Moorish American. Even the colonists are saying between. In their own definition of capitulations, they're talking about two separate parties. But Moors are claiming to be both. Listen. Capitulations is the name used for treaty engagements between the Turkish government, which is the Moroccan Empire, and the Principal. See, they're saying the Principal. You see what they did right here? They're saying what? That they have now taken over. They're superior. That's what Principal means. Principal states of who? Of Europe. Well, what's Europe? That's the Franks. We're going to learn about the Franks here in just a minute. By which the subjects of the latter, residents in, in, in territories of the former. Did you catch what just happened? Let's read it again. Let's take our time. Capitulations is the name used for the treaty engagement between the Moorish government 
and the principal states of the United States by which the subjects of the latter residence in the territory of the former. So who's the latter? States of Europe. Who's the former? The Turkish government. So they're telling you the truth right here. Capitulation means that the European states, the United States, has taken over Moorish governments. Listen. So who, this former said, now we're exempt. Who's exempt? European states, United States of America, listen, is saying they're exempt from what? From the laws. What laws? Okay. Let's move up. Listen, young boys, listen. From the laws of the places where they dwell. So where's the United States dwelling right now? In Morocco. They call it now the United States. It used to be called the United States of America before the United States, of, United States of America colonized Morocco. You look at any map now, it's called what? United States. It ain't called Morocco no more. Why is it called Morocco? Because of the German map maker, the German map maker renamed it America. Morris got to know their history. Listen, this is very interesting right here, Morris. Listen. The usages of the Franks began in what are known in the international law as the capitulations. So who's using capitulations? The Franks, granting rights of extraterritoriality to Christians residing or traveling in Mohammedan countries. Where's Mohammedan countries? Before we look up the Franks, where's Mohammedan countries? Okay, where's Mohammedan countries? Wait a minute. President. Barack H. Obama went to Cairo, Egypt in 2009 before he signed the rights of indigenous people in 2010. Why did he do that? He was trying to tell you about the Mohammedan nations before Barack H. Obama left Cairo, Egypt and he had this speech and quoted Article 11. He told you about the Mohammedan law. Why was he doing that? He was telling the United States administrators that we have an obligation to the treaties. That's why he went and signed the rights of indigenous people. Because the treaty is supreme law of the land. President Barack H. Obama was following the instructions of the treaties by quoting Mohammedan nation because he's talking about what? The laws. The laws of the nation. Where's the word law? Let me find here. There it is. Against the law. I put it in red. And I still missed it. Okay. What? No care to empty against the law. What law? The law of the Mohammedan nation. The Mohammedan nation is the law. What law? The law of the treaties. Let's go back. Capitulations. So right here. They put right here. Capitulations. Right? Right here. Let's start over. The usages of the Franks. We're going to look up Franks. Begin in what are known in international law as the capitulations granting rights of extraterritoriality to Christians residing or traveling in Mohammedan countries. What's Mohammedan country? Morocco. This is why President Barack H. Obama was talking about this in Cairo, Egypt in 2009. Because he knows the United States is where? In Mohammedan countries. What's the Mohammedan country? Morocco. Now, let's go look up, see who the Franks are, so we can understand this paragraph. Okay. I know it's difficult for Moors at home to see this a little fuzzy. You got to do some research. Moors go back and research the Franks. What's the territory of the Franks? Okay. Give you a quick brief. The Franks are nothing but a combination of European countries coming together and colonizing Africa, and as well as commonly known as America. Okay, i.e., Mohammedan nations. They're colonizing Mohammedan nations. So who are the Franks? So you can see this is the map. This is the tip of Morocco. This is Morocco right here, more. Okay? Right here, this is modern day Spain coming on up. The Franks, that's France, okay? You know that's Italy, everybody knows Italy, Rome, etc. Okay? This is what you call the Franks. This is the combination. Make it a little smaller. This is a combination of all your colonial states 
coming together now to come over and colonize Northwest of Mexico, Central of Mexico, and South of Mexico, i.e. the Moroccan Empire. That's the Franks. Collectively, the Franks. Okay, who else is the Franks? Who else is the Franks? English. I know the, know the Moors at home can't see that. Just go back and look at a map. English. England. They're part of the Franks. Okay? So the Franks are the Frankensteins. The Frankensteins. Frankenstein was put together. The Franks came together. The colonial states came together same way they did with the Berlin Conference of 1884. They came together. Okay? So the Berlin Conference of 1884 is number the second rendition of the Franks. Okay? So who are the Franks? Colonists. Okay, let's go back. Let's start from the beginning. The usage of the Franks, colonists, began in what are known in the international law as the capitulation and granting rights of extraterritorial orality to Christians, the Christian powers, residing or traveling in Mohammedan countries. You see right here, they say they resided. They didn't say they domiciled. They say they reside. That's a temporary state. Why is it temporary? Because the treaties expire every 50 years. Or traveling in Mohammedan countries. By these, they're talking instructions. By these instructions, capitulations, a usage was established with that Franks, a generic name for all participants in such privileges. So the United States has what in Morocco? Privileges to stay, because they're doing what? Residing. Privileges being in Turkey. Where's Turkey? Moroccan Empire. Turkey, whether domiciled or temporarily, should be under jurisdiction, civil and criminal, of their respective ministers and consuls. You see what happened? Moors got colonized. The Franks, i.e. the colonists, took over our courts. So now when you go back and you read the French Protectorate of 1913, now do you understand why France came over and to start talking about Moors and Council Court because on the capitulation, the colonists took away our Council Courts of Moors governments and made the Moors think they were Americans. Let's continue. I know that Ann Pack pointed out some things this evening. That a lot of Moors may or may not take offense to. But one thing I do know is this. Moors got to go back and study, study, study their own history. You have to study your own treaties. And your treaties never refer to you as being American unless it refers to you as being a protege or subject of the Americans. But it never refers to you as being the American. As we start to wrap up, these are the four trees. The four trees. The four trees. Bilateral treaty of peace and friendship, 1836, right? That, that should have been 1787. I do apologize. It should have been 1787. It was about what? A more and a more state government. So the Moors. At that time, they still had some governments. Then the Bilateral Treaty of Peace and Friendship, 1836, about what? A more and a more state government is about Moors dealing with the Americans. And then what happens in 1880? Multilateral, multilateral, multilateral treaty of Madrid in 1880. What happens? Now all of a sudden, a stateless Moor and protege and subject status. Our status changed. These first two treaties, we have more governments. Then on the capitulation, they ran, out, ran us out of government by 1880. We became stateless Moors because we had no more states, and we became protégés and subjects. That's why the Sultan had to put together this treaty to define the rights of Moors when they come back to their own governments. What else happened? The multilateral, multilateral, multilateral treaty of the Act of Algeciras, 1906, which is a Moroccan treaty, is about what? A stateless Moor and protege of subject status. 
But none of these treaties refer to you as being the American. It all refers to you as being a protege of America until you come back to Morocco. That's what these treaties are all about, getting you back to yourself. The Moors have to come back into Islam. I self law and master. Master of what? Master and understanding that you're not American. You never have been and never will be. Now, AMPAC can point out problems. But you know, AMPAC is all about solutions, too. Let's talk about solutions. This is the Act of Algeceras, 1906, Chapter 7, Articles 120 through 123. I just point out a lot of misconceptions. But the young boys, especially young boys, young boys got to start reading the treaties, and the treaties tell you specific instructions, young boys. Let's read the instructions that the Moors have to comply to in order for you to start getting back into what's called the entire submission of the laws of the empire. Okay, mother. Let's go ahead and read. Article chapter 7, general provisions. Article 120. With a view to harmonizing its legislation, if the occasion arises with the engagements contracted under the present general act, each of the signatory powers engages to take the necessary steps leading to the enactment of such legislation as may be necessary so far as it is concerned. Okay, so what do we just learn, young boys? We're talking instructions. We're talking the answers to the text, boys. Listen, this was the Sultan laid down. This is part of the triple principles. This is mandatory. Article 120, with a view to harmonizing, that means coming together, integrity of domains, it's legislation if the occasion arises with the engagements contracted. So it's a contract. The act out says it's a contract. Moors must understand what's called strict liability of contract. When Moors are working outside the contract, that makes you an outlaw. You can't take any shortcuts, Moors. You can't cheat the process. You must trust the process and check the boxes. Listen. With a view to harmonizing his legislation, if the occasion arises with the engagement of contracted under the present general act, each of the signatory powers engagements to take the necessary steps leading to the engagement of such legislation. So Moors have to take the necessary step to engage legislation. Legislation of what? Your constitution. This is AMPAC's constitution. That's the step. Constitution. What's the next step? Okay. Instructions tell you, young lords. Okay, young lords, let's go. It says what? Each of the signatory powers engagement to take the necessary steps leading to the enactment of such legislation as may be necessary so far as it concerns. So you have to do it, right? These are instructions. Supreme law of the land. Okay, mother. Article 121. The present general act shall be ratified according to the constitutional laws of each state. The ratifications shall be deposited at Madrid as soon as practicable, and at the latest by December 31st, 1906. Okay, what's happening? Young Lord, these are the instructions. You are a Moorish American until you come back and submit to the entire laws of the empire. How do you do that? Okay, Article 121. The present general act shall be ratified according to the constitutional laws of each state. Moors got to come back to the constitutional laws of each state. And do what? Ratify. The ratification shall be deposited, deposited, deposited at Madrid. Now, we all know Madrid now is the United Nations Charter Secretariat as soon as practicable. Those are the instructions. What's the instructions? Right here. Constitutional laws, ratification, and depository. Those are the instructions. These are the answers to the test. Since 1906.
Okay, well, right here, a process. A process verbal shall be made of such deposit and a certified copy sent to each of the signatory powers through the diplomatic channel. Okay, so what happens? Once the more is put on the record, you got your constitution, now you proceed it, ratify it to the treaties, declarations, etc., conventions. What do you do next? Now you must take your constitution and deposit it with the Secretary of the United Nations along with your treaties, declarations, and conventions, all of it. Put it on the record. After that, what is the United Nations Charter Secretary, what's their responsibility? Now to notify all the signatory powers that have signed on the bilateral treaties and multilateral treaties that now you are party to that contract. Article 122. The present general act shall enter into effect as soon as all the ratifications shall have been deposited, and at the latest on December 31st, 1906. Okay, so what's happening? Listen, Morris. These are the instructions. Look what the United Nations obligation is. Listen. 122, the present general act shall enter into effect as soon as all the ratifications shall have been deposited. So as soon as Moors ratify it and deposit it, it becomes active. You're not waiting on the United Nations to tell you you can use it. You're not waiting on the United States to tell you you can use it. It becomes active. This is 1906. We're in the year January 2022. In case the special legislative measures which may be necessary in certain countries to ensure the application to their nationals living in Morocco of certain stipulations of this present general act shall not have been enacted by the date fixed for ratification, these stipulations shall only become applicable in respect to them after the legislative measures above referred to have been promulgated. Did you hear that, Morris? What does it mean? Your treaties are not enforceable until you ratify it for your state. Let's listen. Listen, Morris. These are the answers to the test since 1906. In case of special legislative measures, which may be necessary in certain countries to ensure the application to their nationals living in Morocco. So Morris live in Morocco. We live in Morocco. We don't reside in Morocco, we live in Morocco, so these are our instructions. Because we're not Americans, but these instructions for Moors and the signatory powers to do what? In Morocco, if certain stipulations of this present general act shall not have been enacted by the date fixed for ratification. So if they hadn't done it, they had to go back and ratify it through their state. What happens? If that shall not have been enacted by the date fixed for ratification, these stipulations shall only become applicable in respect to them after, after the legislative measures above referred to shall have been promulgated. What does that mean? Did you follow the instructions? Did you go back to your state? Do you have a constitution? Do you have a state? And did you come back and ratify the treaties? Did you come back and ratify the treaties? Listen to me, more. Did you come back? All the treaties, declarations, the charter, the conventions. Did you come back and take these and ratify them through your state and put it on the record of your internal state? It becomes the law of your state, just like that. Your constitution and these treaties now become one. Then what do you do? You take your constitution, all your treaties, declarations, and conventions. You do what now? You take it and put it on the record with the United Nations Charter. Y'all got a copy. After you have a copy, they got to send all this to the other signatory powers that signed on to all the treaties, conventions, and declarations, and the Charter of the United Nations to let them know the new modern Moorish state is on the record. These are the instructions. And if Moors have not followed the instructions of the treaties, treated supreme law of the land, what does that mean? That means you're American. That means you're a protege. 
That means you're a subject of America. And that means you're a Moorish American legally. But you are not a Moorish national of a Moorish state enforcing Moorish treaties because you can't enforce treaties. You can't enforce constitutions. You can't enforce conventions. You can't enforce declarations until you follow the instruction. The Sultan told the colonists they couldn't enforce it. So my question to the Moors is this. Are you American? And the answer is yes, in fact, and no, in truth. And what's the truth? When you come back and submit to the entire laws of the empire, then then the truth is you are more through your state. Until then, you are a protege subject of the United States, which makes you a stateless more. I am with that. Islam.